hot in Chicago like that's a very normal thing to purchase and find at, at garden centers and my friends in Chicago all had native plants in their yard I think it's just uh, prairie plants they're just well known and well loved purple cone flowers and, and grasses um, and then moved here nine years ago and had kind of culture shock uh, going to the garden centers and trying to find uh, native plants and not finding any um, and so, yeah, after years, I'd convince friends, and we're gonna go into kind of why native, obviously, um, but I'd convince friends why they should put some native plants in their yard. And they'd say, okay, I'm in, where should I go? And I'd say, well, you have to actually drive to Framingham uh, to garden in the woods. And you really have to really research ahead of time and you know, know the botanical names, and there's just, it, feel, it felt sometimes like native plants were not accessible. Um, so we are trying to be a different kind of garden center. We're just a regular garden center. We're a nursery. We grow most of our own plants, um, but we are native only. So we don't have any non-native plants that we carry. Um, and that's really because you can find all the non-native plants you want at literally every other garden center. Um, so we saw the demand um, and we saw a lack of supply. So we decided to um, start a nursery. So we started in 2021. Um, well, actually, we started late 2020 um, during the pandemic. Um, we did all our meetings on Google Meet, like online Zoom meetings um, to plan the business. Um, and now we are, well, I'll show you some pictures. You can see we've come a long way. All right, so this is, this is me. This is Kristen. She's uh, my, the co-owner with me. Um, and our goal is really like making native plants accessible. Um, even if anyone's been on any of the Facebook pages for native plants, can get real intense real fast. Um, if you don't know, again, like your botanical names and it's, you know, it's just, can be hard to get into the native plants. So um, this is what we started with. We're leasing land in Norwell. Um, and this is actually in one of the after photos before, I should have a picture of this too, it was just full of garbage um, and invasive like mugwort and uh, lots and lots of garbage. So we cleaned it up um, and this is us, this was last year. So we um, built a greenhouse and we're growing our plants more and more. Um, our goal is to grow all of our own plants, but the demand is high enough that we can't keep up. So we're growing a lot of our own plants and bringing in plants from other growers as well, because the, the demand is, is huge. Um, and we are, we kind of have three pillars to our business. So we are a nursery and garden center. Um, we do, I'm gonna skip over there, we do education. So we do a lot of presentations, we do workshops. Um, this is my daughter's uh, brownie troop coming in to plant plants um, over there. Um, and then something that's newer for us is we have a seed farm. So we're trying to grow from local seed wherever possible. So I could buy some uh, purple coneflower seeds from plants that were grown in California for the last 30 years. Um, and those seeds would then grow into purple coneflowers that would not know what to do with our nor'easters. Um, so there's a lot of genetic information in those seeds. So having a seed farm allows us to, we collect some seeds from the wild, um, grow those plants out, save those seeds, grow out new plants to sell. It's a labor of love. This was a few years ago, I need to update the picture. So native plants are essentially plants that were here uh, before European like large European settlement is sort of like the agreed upon thought about native plants. Um, sometimes it said native plants were here uh, without human introduction, but uh, Native Americans, uh, you know, occasionally moved plants as well. So it's sort of uh, prior to European settlement, um, plants that were here are native. So um, this is Lobelia syphilitica. 
uh, great blue lobelia, lobelia which is endangered. Uh, so a non-native plant obviously uh, brought by humans on purpose or accident in crates or you know people are coming from other countries missing their homeland and bringing in the plants of the homeland. Um, and a non-native plant can be invasive or not invasive or it can be not invasive but come become invasive over time. Um, and invasive plants are plants that, does anyone, I should hide that, see who knows that one. <laughs> yeah, garlic mustard. Um, monopolize aggressively. So garlic mustard in its homeland, lovely. Like it, it's great. Here though, it just takes over. It gives off like biochemicals. Its roots do so that nothing else can grow near and that's one of its mechanisms for spreading. So it monopolizes space and soil and sun and native species just can't compete. Native plants technically cannot be in, called invasive. So we have things that, we have native plants that are aggressive, Canada anemone, if anyone's planted that and regretted it. Um, aggressive native plants have their place. Um, if you're fighting something like you've torn out a bunch of garlic mustard, planting Canada anemone to help fill in the area, um, they, they're, they're great, but they can't be technically um, invasive. You might not want them in your yard, like um, common milkweed can be like iffy in a tiny yard, mm -hmm. but, um, and naturalized would be a plant that's become just commonplace. So qu people come all the time and ask for Queen Anne's lace and we're a New England native nursery and we have to break the news to them that that's not native here. But we sell also only um, straight species. We grow pretty much all from seed and straight species are how native plants naturally grow in the wild. A cultivar, if anyone's ever seen, so on a sign, if it just says this, Echinacea pupuria, that means it's like just the plant. That's nothing dramatic about it. If it says Echinacea pupuria and then in single quotes some cute name, double decker or you know bikini, whatever, um, and that's a cultivar. And those are generally created through cloning, which as you can assume, cloning has, has poor genetics to it. And native R is the same as a cultivar. Does anyone have nine bark copertina in their yard? No, I do and I, I shouldn't. Um, but as soon as we start messing with the genetics of the plants, like scientifically messing with it, we actually change uh, the usefulness of the plant. So on the left um, here is the straight species, nine bark, like you'd find in the wild. Um, and then on the right is nine bark copertina. It's beautiful, I have it in my yard and absolutely no caterpillars on it ever, which is a bad thing. And we'll talk more about why that's a bad thing, but caterpillars cannot identify it as food. Um, so there are species that, insect species that depend on nine bark in order to survive and they cannot live on my nine bark copertina. And the same when you're changing a cone flower, which is like such a great source of nectar and we're making it the double blossoms, the pollinators cannot get to the nectar. So we're making it lovely for our eyes and it's completely removing it like from the, the ecosystem as part of the ecosystem. Um, are you all familiar with Doug Tallamy? Yeah. So if you don't know him, wonderful speaker, wonderful books, and talks a lot about um, insect and plant interactions. Okay, so why native? I'm gonna go through a bunch of reasons why native. And I'll say for myself, I've, uh, I grew up gardening with my grandma, vegetable gardening, and she had a beautiful tulip garden. Um, and then when I was an adult, I had my own first house and I planted for myself how things would be beautiful and would look, which is a great reason to, to plant plants. Um, and then a few years later, a friend gave me a pot. She was very into native plants. She gave me a pot of Black Eyed Susans and I planted them and that winter I had goldfinch coming to eat the seed off the seed heads and that was my aha moment. Like, okay, this needs to not, even though I was in Chicago, it was a tiny yard, but I ended up putting a lot of native plants in and I wildlife all over. Um, so for me, the aha was the, for me it was the bird connection. Um, I've always loved birds. 
Uh, and so that's sort of how I started. But, um, so it provides food, nectar, and habitat for birds, butterflies, and other wildlife. Um, so talking about caterpillars on plant leaves, and you all were talking about monarch butterflies before. So we have had a, a customer came in once and said, I have these yellow, black, and white caterpillars on my plants, and so I killed them. How do I keep those from eating my plants? And I, we were like, no, like that's the monarch caterpillar. So we're so in tune to want to kill any insects on our plant. It's, it's sort of drilled into us, like the pesticide company, like all, all insects need to be killed, right? Um, and that's a, such a terrible way of thinking, but we're so um, trained to that. So not only are monarch butterflies gorgeous and important, and not all animals can eat them because they're somewhat toxic, but they're food for someone else as well. So they're, they're part of the system. Black-capped chickadees, parents bring anywhere from 390 to 570 caterpillars to their nest per day, which is just like staggering. The more we, and we're going to talk about how native plants support those caterpillars. So if you're a bird person, plant native, and you will be helping songbirds. That's not my picture, but that was like my aha was like the goldfinch eating the seed heads. Like it's the original bird feeder, right? Like the dried seed heads. And we're so used to, we need to cut everything to the ground in the fall and have it all cleaned up. Um, but we were cutting off all the, the bird food. Yeah, like the typical suburban lawn, if you look out your window, it doesn't support really anything. Like kids playing soccer, lawns are important for people, but a lot of times we just have the, the meatball shrubs and then the lawn. So it's really, lawns are often not part of it, the ecosystem. So here's obviously two different types of lawns. And you can have a lawn that has a lot of native plants without it feeling like a wild jungle. So I live um, in Hingham, uh, which is close to Norwell, and my neighbors all have lawns that look like this. <laughs> and then mine looks more like that. And I've purposefully tried to, I have some little gravel pathways. I have a little sign saying this is a native plant garden. I support wildlife. Um, and I have a grassy area in the front, so I'm trying to fit in with the neighbors, but still have a lot of wild plants. Post plant, so this is really why we started the business, was roughly 90% of, of insects need a specific plant or a specific family of plants in order to survive. So our poster child for host plant uh, is the monarch butterflies. Caterpillar can only eat milkweeds. And as someone here said earlier, there's actually a bunch of milkweeds that are native here. There are other milkweeds that are native elsewhere. Um, but the, the milkweed that is here, um, any of them will support the, the caterpillar or larva stage of the monarch butterfly. So people often come in and say, I would like to support the monarchs or I'd like to support pollinators. And oftentimes, that's thinking more about mm, the butterflies having nectar to drink. So we need to change our thinking into thinking about those host plants, because if there are no milkweeds and no monarch caterpillars, we have no monarch butterflies. So we'll say to when people come in and say, we want to plant something for a pollinator garden, we'll say literally plant anything here. Every single native plant is a host plant for some insect somewhere. <clears throat> So the one we know is, oh, here's a cute little guy I found. Um, the one we know so well, I just think he's so cute. Uh, the one we know so well are the, the monarch and the milkweeds. Here's a bunch of milkweeds that are native to New England. This one is a swamp milkweed. It's been renamed to rose milkweed because it does not need a swamp. So it's sort of new PR uh, for that one. Uh, butterfly milkweed, world milkweed. There's common milkweed. And I think that's Asclepius exaltata, which the name, the common name is escaping me. But a lot of beautiful milkweeds to choose from. And super, super dry soil. Like if you have a hell strip that gets next to a road that gets salt on it, like this is who you want. And if you have a little bit more moisture, this is a great one. And even 
There's one of them that's not pictured that does well in shade. So if, if we have no milkweed from pesticide usage or people not planting it because it has the word weed in it, like that's a little bit of a turnoff, right? Like I'd like to, to plant weed. We will have no monarchs. So if you want monarchs for your children, grandchildren, and beyond, we have to plant. We have to plant the milkweed. Um, and so this is literally, like I said, every single native plant is a host plant, a food plant for some larva of some beautiful um, butterfly or moth. Um, a lot of native plants host at-risk bumblebees. Um, if you've never heard of Dr. Um, Robert Jagir, it's G-E-G-E-A-R, and I can email this later, some resources, but he does, um, I think he's out of like Dartmouth, and he does research on at-risk bumblebees, and there's a lot of them, and so a lot of the plants we sell are for uh, at-risk bumblebees. I'm thinking of, does anyone know um, turtle head? Mm -hmm. So at, at the nursery, we constantly have like the little bumblebee butts sticking out of, and they're the only ones that can get in um, to pollinate. So a lot of native plants support a lot of wildlife. This is my favorite, uh, one of my favorites, um, pussy toes, which are great on the Cape, and I'll show you more info about them. Super dry soil, sun, and they are a host plant for the painted lady. So this was a customer's video. She literally planted these, and a painted lady came and laid eggs. So you can see she comes and late. So if you plant it, they will find you. And it's amazing how that works, but it's true. So spice bush swallowtail need the spice bush. Those are well named. You can see the little caterpillar on the bottom. Oh, and I'm gonna I'm gonna throw this out there, not to like get off topic, but. Um, there's this whole push for leaving the leaves. So in fall, instead of scooping up all your leaves and throwing them away, leaving the leaves. And insects such as spice bush swallowtails are ones they wrap themselves up and fall to the ground. And those are ones that you'll find in your leaves. But you can't tell. So if you throw them all away, you're throwing away future spice bush swallowtails. So leave the leaves. Fritillary need violets. Carner blue need wild lupine. If you go to Maine and you see all the beautiful lupine, it's actually not the native lupine. It is uh, extinct technically in Maine. So people came in and planted a Western or a California lupine in, and that is what has taken over. And it has also made their offspring that, that the Carner blue butterfly is now endangered because it doesn't have its host plant. Its, its larva doesn't have the correct lupine anymore. So it's interesting if you go on the um, Massachusetts government website, you can see a list of endangered insects and they so exactly match up with endangered plants because those, if those insects don't have those plants, then there's real trouble. And it's easier for something like a fritillary. There's so many violets it can, can eat, but something like the Carner Blue, like that's just their one, their one food. Um, so spring azures need silky dogwood, hoary elfins need bearberry, which I'm guessing a lot of you maybe have here on the Cape. It's such a good Cape plant. Um, and on and on and on. So literally every native plant has something that it hosts. Another reason for native is native plants save water and reduce soil runoff and erosion. Storms come in, they run down the lawn, which maybe has been treated with pesticides and fertilizers, a little dog waste over here, um, running down the driveway, catching some of the oil, and that ends up in our waterway. Um, and so it's a real problem. So if we can keep the water on our property, that is ideal. And one way to do that is to remove some of the turf. So you can see the root system of there's Kentucky bluegrass. And some of these aren't, they're more Midwestern native, but I thought this was a good graphic. So you can see well, like t 20 feet deep on some. So if you plant native plants, that will help keep water on your property. So you can see the, the, the difference between the turf runoff and this is kind of a rain, has anyone, rain gardens? Um, so planted with intention and that water will very quickly get sucked into that root system.
using native plants reduce the time, energy, and pollution of mowing. One, this is kind of unbelievable, but it's true. Uh, one hour of lawnmower use is equal to th driving 300 miles from LA to Vegas. And even more interesting is one hour of leaf blower use is driving uh, over a thousand miles from LA to Denver because leaf blowers are not gas leaf blowers, I should say, are not regulated at all. So cars are way more regulated than leaf blowers are. So in, in addition to killing all those, um, those insects that were overwintering in the leaves and the noise pollution, it's also polluting the air. Native plants add beauty to our environment and give us a sense of place. So this has been fun for me as a Chicagoan, uh, coming and seeing, there's a lot of different native plants here. Um, the seaside goldenrod, um, the, the beach grass. So you can see like the difference between like, yes, we are on the coast of Massachusetts and kind of the average lawn that could literally be anywhere in the country, which are fun. It's fun to plant around your trees, but using plants that are native really give a sense of, of where you are. And here's, uh, so these are all native, small yellow wild indigo, prickly pear cactus, which are native, uh, the butterfly milkweed, and then black-eyed Susan. So it just, um, yeah, native plants give a sense of place. And they're also adapted to their environment. They've been adapting for a very, very long time. So they don't need extra water. They don't need fertilizer. You just need to put the right plant in the right place. So sometimes customers will say, I really want this plant. So I'm going to, but I have, like, it likes moisture and they only have dry soil. So I'm going to set up a whole watering system. And we're like, how about you come look at the plants that want the dry? There's so many plants that would be so happy in dry soil. So sometimes we have to steer customers into getting the, the right plant for the right place. And that's kind of long term. It's more sustainable if we're not having to water our plants. Um, my native plants are always like, I've never, like, I planted my garden eight years ago. And I, first year I watered a bit, but have not since. In a drought, I haven't watered. Um, and my neighbors who have lawns water constantly, height of the summer, and I, I don't have to water. Um, so putting the right plant in the right place. Lawn irrigation in the US at nine billion gallons per day, which is kind of crazy. And 60 million lawns are fertilized each year in the United States. It's a lot of nitrogen that then when the storms come, that excess nitrogen gets washed into waterways, causes algae bloom, causes like dead spots, um, and kills wildlife in the water. So yeah, right plant, right place. This was just my like very obvious. <laughs> Palm tree would not do well. But the beach grass, no problem. Coneflower, no problem. And, and has evolved so long that it is um, food for those goldfinch or any of the other winter birds that are here. They've all kind of co-evolved together. So native plants actually, their seeds actually need winter in order to germinate. So a tomato seed, uh, non-native tomato seed, you can plant, you can sow and grow anytime. So native plants have evolved to need winter to unlock the ability to germinate in the spring. So if you think about if a native plant uh, put its seed down in October, and then it grew little seedlings, and then our Boston winters came through, that plant would not do so well. So they have figured out over time to sit in the snow and the ice and thaw and get snowed on and 13 feet of snow. We moved here right when the like 13 feet of snow came and the plants were all fine. Um, so why not non-native or invasive, well, I'll say invasive plants. And we are, my business partner and I are not perfectionists. Uh, we are not um, coming at this from a place where we're like native plants are the only thing you should ever have. I have tulips in my yard. I have a lot of, I have things that remind me of my mom that are non-native. Um, we are not anti non-native, but we are anti invasive plants um, because invasive plants cost the US taxpayers so much money and cause so many problems for wildlife. So this is kudzu, which was planted in Georgia to help with uh, slope stabilization. And it is now known as the plant that ate the south. And if you go down to the south, you'll see like the shape of a forest with this kudzu. Um, and they've spent a lot of money trying to beat this back. And planted with good intention, like for slope stabilization, but 
but gone wrong. So anytime we can just plant native, we know it's going to behave here. It's just easier. So this is an English ivy infestation. The state of Massachusetts has a list of plants that we are not allowed to buy, sell, or trade. So burning bush, you are not allowed to trade it. You're not, I'm not allowed to sell it. We're not allowed to buy it. Um, for some reason, English ivy is not on that list. But I know I live in Hingham, and there's a state park there, and it's like just acres of English ivy. So I'm guessing at some point, this one will be on the list. Um, there are a lot of people who grow this who don't want it on the list, um, but, but it should be. I'm sure you've all seen woods that look like that with English ivy and vinca as well, which is not on the, the list either. Yeah, yeah. So burning bush, beautiful. Like there's obviously a reason why people like to plant it. But, and we'll go into this in, in the next slide. High seed production is typical of many of the invasive plants and the berries. So burning bush on the top and a blue jay coming eating some berries and in theory like we're feeding the birds however that bird is going to go out in the woods and make a deposit <laughs> poop out the berries and it's not usually in the same yard they will fly off to the woods and i i see on facebook all the time uh, burning bush is not invasive in my yard so you're crazy like that's a constant thread even i, I wrote a whole blog post about it and i put in the blog post. People on Facebook always say, burning bush is not invasive in my yard. And I posted it on Facebook and people commented, burning bush is not invasive in my yard. Ugh, read the article. Um, but they go out and they poop and then the woods are just covered in burning bush. So yeah, even the wonderful Martha Stewart on her Instagram page posted a picture of herself riding through her woods on a horse in the fall. And she says, here's all my burning bush. Isn't it beautiful? And commenters were like, no, Martha, that's invasive. You need to remove those. And she said, they are not invasive in my woods. But literally, that's all there is as far as I can see. So um, she got a schooling from her Facebook followers, thankfully. Um, but it's something like a blueberries are native here. And something like if a bird eats a blueberry and goes off and poops that somewhere, that's a great thing because that will grow plants that feed so many things from humans to birds to butterflies and caterpillars and squirrels and, and so on. So native plants really are like the food. So here's some Cape favorites. So prickly pear, people are always shocked that there's a cactus that's native, but it is. In the winter, it looks like a deflated balloon and then it comes back yeah. up. Obviously loves, like any cactus, sunny, dry, sandy soil, which I know you all have a lot here of. Um, purple love grass uh, is a great one. It fold apart sun, dry to average, host plant for a butterfly. Um, if anyone is looking to see if something is native here, Go Botany is our go-to. And I can't remember if it's like Go Botany at Native Plant Trust, but if you type in Go Botany. So every single plant that we grow, we first check Go Botany and see if it's native in this area, and if it's not, we don't grow it. Purple lovegrass is a fabulous one. If you ever are on Route 3, a little bit more north, in the fall, like late summer, you'll see purple, like a purple haze along the highway, and that's purple lovegrass. So if it can, and it's got a lovely name, people love it. Cardinal flower, it's like the number one hummingbird plant. If you have an area that's a little more moist, this is a great one to plant, um, fold apart sun, and it's kind of, it's not the longest lived plant. Has anyone planted this one? No, it's got like, it puts out like a billion of the tiniest seeds you've ever seen. And if you want to keep it in your yard for a very long time, the trick is, or if this is the plant, after it puts its seed down, if you just scratch the soil up a little bit right next to it, um, it thrives on disturbance. So out in the woods, if there's cardinal seed, seeds everywhere and a tree falls, cardinal flower will be the first thing to bloom until other things take over. Um, bearberry, I know is big uh, over like the dune, the dunes area, growing in literally just sand. Full sun, part sun, host plant for a bunch of things. Butterfly milkweed is one of the milkweeds. This is native to the Cape.
Uh, and everything I'm showing here is native to the Cape. It supports so many things and it's beautiful and it's hard to find native plants that have orange flowers. So it's kind of unique and it's kind of interesting. We, we built our website to be very robust and to be able to search by almost like an Amazon, like I want a red shirt size, large, you know, short sleeve. So you can search for, I want an orange plant, you know, orange flowering plant, uh, fall blooming and whatever, and it can, it'll can it spit back out to you what there is. But native plants are almost exotic at this point. So everything I have in my yard, no one else in my neighborhood has. So um, yeah, it's kind of fun to be different. Nice <laughs> it is a nice thing. And people stop, once I put my sign up that said like this is a wildlife garden, people actually stop and, and look at everything. And um, it's been interesting, small little yard. Christmas fern is a great one if you have a shadier spot. It's evergreen, um, which is lovely. Anyone have New Jersey tea? This is a lovely one. Full sun to part sun, dry to average. So this has good Boston connections with the whole Boston tea party rejecting. I'm a Chicagoan, so I, you know, just heard about this. But rejecting the tea from England, they New Jersey tea is one of the plants they used as an alternative tea. So the leaves from this can be dried and turned into tea. And it also, it hosts plant for over 45 species of butterflies and moth in the larval stage. Service berry, gorgeous plant, moist to average soil. This is my yard here. And it supports over 117 species of butterflies and moth, including luna moth, um, which is another one that overwinters in the, in the leaves. So plant this, not that. So vinca, it's not yet on the invasive list. It's got to be at some point. It's so aggressive and it's also all anyone plants. So when you go to a traditional garden center, like that's the ground cover, that or the pachysandra. So many great alternatives. Hartley foam flower, shade, part shade, moist to average soil, like just these gorgeous foamy flowers. Really easy and wonderfully pushy. So if you have an area you need to fill in, this is a lovely one to plant. Another one is, this is my all-time favorite plant, 3-2 Sinquefoil. Real similar, like good, it's a good cape plant. So full sun part sun, dried average soil. Sabaldiopsis tridentata. It's got the most lovely little white flower on it. Um, it's just darling and it spreads. And if you struggle with Creeping Charlie, I have this battling Creeping Charlie in my yard and I've kind of been watching to see who, who's yeah. gonna win. And this is evergreen, and so it's doing better than the, the Creeping short. Charlie. It's right. very short right. and it's very dense mm -hmm. and it's evergreen. So it's not letting that Creeping Charlie get a purchase on where it is. So one of my other, I have so many favorites, is the Plantain Pussy Toes, the Antenaria, which we saw the, the butterfly laying eggs on before. Really likes, we have a lot of things here, that like dry, dry soil, full sun. And they're Pussy Toes, because they're like the little flowers look like Cat's toes, I guess. Um, if you go to our website, so bluestemnatives.com, we have, I've, we put too much information on the website. We're trying to like pare it down and reorganize. But if you want to know what to plant instead of vinca, we actually have a whole list. This is up on the website. There's a lot of things that you can plant. So burning bush, like we talked about. So great fall, or great fall color, although now that I don't, love burning bush because of how invasive it is. I find the color a little obnoxious. Like it's very like, it's a real intense red. We have so many beautiful native shrubs that have like better fall color. Chokeberry is one and it gets these orangey, purpley reds. Um, there's many species of chokeberry. This one I think is the black chokeberry. This is my, I have all the chokeberries. I, it's one of my favorite. One of my favorites, again, full sun, part sun, and they vary in what they need, the different choke berries. So that's a great one. Fragrant sumac is beautiful. Um, Rus aromatica, full sun to shade, moist to dry soil. I have that in my yard as well. And the blueberries, and there's many different types of blueberries that are native here and many different heights. And they, they range anywhere from needing wet to dry soil. And their, their fall color is just outstanding. And huge, this is a list on our website of burning bush alternatives. There's so many, I just couldn't even list them. We really have beautiful choices here. Butterfly bush, this one, hopefully no one like throws tomatoes at me. People love their butterfly bush, it has a lovely 
name. It is covered with butterflies when it is blooming. When it is not blooming, it is not doing anything for wildlife. Its leaves are not supporting anything. And 90, maybe I already said this, I don't remember, 90% of insects are specialists and they need one specific native plant in order to survive. And so burning bush, I'm sorry, butterfly bush is not native here, so it has nothing depending on it. It has nectar, um, but that's it. Uh, so if you, and I'm guessing at some point it's gonna be on the invasive list, like it's, it's very aggressive. And I see people giving away little ones all the time because yeah, they're just in everyone's yard. yard. Yeah, I so everywhere, <laughs> yes, and they're beautiful. They're beautiful and they have a beautiful name. So um, if you want to try something else, steeple bush has a very similar look to it. New England blazing star is gorgeous and has even better flowers. Rose milkweed is beautiful. So the plants again that I'm showing you support wildlife in hundreds of different ways. And again, I have butterfly bush alternatives. And if you love your butterfly bush, we do not hold that against you. <laughs> People sometimes will say, come and say like, I want to show you a picture, but I have non-native plants in my yard. <laughs> We're like, so do we, like it's okay, it's okay. So the non-native sweet autumn clematis that I know people love, it's beautiful, it, you know, grows like crazy, um, but it's, it's aggressive and it's invasive, I think, in some other states. The native trumpet honeysuckle is beautiful, Lonicera semper virens. There's a different um, thing that's called trumpet honeysuckle that's native um, in the south, but this is our true native honeysuckle. And it's gorgeous and it blooms March to October. So I saw on Facebook someone posted my I have a, a trumpet honeysuckle, it's new to me and it's blooming already. Like, like yeah, that's totally normal. So it's, it blooms constantly. We have in our house, we eat uh, dinner in front of a big bay window and I have this planted out in front and there's always a hummingbird there. Always one, because of the two there. It's a vine, yep, it's a vine. And I have it trained on a short fence, so it looks more like a shrub. Um, and then I just kind of like tangle it and it kind of does its own thing. But it, it, the only thing is that it's a honeysuckle, but it doesn't have a scent. It does not have a scent, right. There is, um, I think the... The coral is also native, but that doesn't have a scent either. Yeah, but the, um, there is a clematis that is native, uh, virgin's bower or Devil's Darning Needles, it's his, <laughs> its other name. Uh, and that, I believe, has a scent to it. All right, and that's it. Um, so here's three books I'd recommend if you're looking for books to read, although this one is out of print and costs now like $500, so I've got to take it off my list. But this is wonderful. Um, Dan Jaffe, um, he goes by Dan Wilder now. Uh, if you can ever see a presentation with him, he's wonderful. He's at Norcross in Massachusetts. He wrote this book along with Mark Richardson. Um, anything Doug Tallamy. He's written a bunch of books and they're all wonderful and he gives great lectures. So I think that's it for me. Um, all right, any questions? Yep. So we plant a lot of planters, uh, a lot of mainstream. Okay. Investors that are and we're getting yeah. 10 brand new ones. Great. From the town. Mm -hmm. no and we were thinking, what could we plant? It's full sun. They get watered once a week. They're in a self-watering container. All right, so we have resources for you. All right, so what to plant? Native plants and container gardening. So we have um, online resources, all sorts of lists. And then we have a list down here, native plants for containers, including their water needs, their sun needs, their height, their bloom time. Yeah, so you can go, and there's a lot. Like most native plants are fine in a container. But, um, and actually this is three pages long, so <laughs> there's a lot of choices. Butterfly milkweed is a great choice. It's short. Um, you want something that's not gonna like flop over. Like I'm thinking like a bee balm often like flops, but there are things that are a little shorter that are a little more stout. Right? The, 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 orange the orange, yeah, milkweed. butterfly yeah. milkweed. Um, yeah, like a grass of some sort, prairie drop seed grass is like a little shorter grass. Um, the purple love grass is great if you kind of, and I know I've heard like the years for planters, like the, the thriller, the yeah. spiller, and the yeah. chiller. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So bearberry um, is a little bit of a spiller. Um, the three-tooth cinquefoil, 
if you put it kind of on the edge, it spills a little bit. Um, lobelia, yep. Um, so there's two lobelias that are native. Uh, so it, is it it's full sun? I should have asked that. Full sun. Um, the, so the cardinal flower needs a, a decent amount of water, so you might need to like replant that every year. Almost and there are annual native annuals that might do well. Um, partridge pea is a great one um, that would that would do well in a container in full sun, fit like fast filling. But the, some of the perennials in, in a pot that big, we could plant perennials. Yes, definitely. You yeah, and even like we did a. a a planting workshop and we planted in like foot and a half wide like little they're honestly like native plant like they go through again like our nor'easters and our winters and our rocky soil like they're kind of built <laughs> built to last so happy in a planter the only thing I would do is like don't fill it if you're going with natives don't fill it with like super super rich soil um, our native like use a lot of the native sandy soil um, because you can, people will often like over baby the native plants. Like they don't need for fertilizer. They don't need to be planted in straight in compost. Like just any kind of. In, that. in in a thick, rich, you would want to pick some, like cardinal flower would be happy in a richer soil. Did you think of the cone flower? Cone flower would be beautiful. Yeah, so and then black eyed Susan. Black eyed Susans they, would be they, great. They keep blooming. Oh, they're blowing over. Mm -hmm. So you can cut them early on, like the Chelsea chop, have you heard that? Like you do an early cutting so they grow shorter and stouter. So that's a possibility. Um, and so purple cone flowers technically are not native to New England, but we do carry them because they are the poster child for native plants. So if you have purple cone flowers in a pot, people will drive by and know that this is a native pot, where if you have other things, they might not know, but it's sort of like marketing native plants, like look how beautiful they are. So we do carry purple coneflower for that reason, because they're so recognizable, um, and that, that would be great in a planter. And I guess it would just be like trying to match up similar plant needs. So if you had like a cardinal flower, which really wants moist, picking other moist loving plants and keeping it well watered. Does that continue to flower? <clears throat> the cardinal flower does. So it starts on the, the, it's got like a long stalk. It starts to flower on the bottom okay. and then it just keeps marching up like new flowers form. These die and turn into like, not die, but they turn into seed heads on yeah, the bottom. So it's going to be damp, then the uh, turtle head. The turtle head, turtle head yeah. Bone. Yeah. We're, we're, we're very much into like letting go of like perfectionism and like plant native where you can and yeah, see the, the wonderful wildlife that comes for a visit. Any other questions? <coughs> that was wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank you. Oh, <laughs> yeah.